Well, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the as a live webinar on COVID-19. Unfortunately, this is a topic, as we all know, that needs no introduction to anyone on the planet. We're all too familiar with the human and incredible economic toll um, taken globally from the headlines that we see. The purpose of this webinar today is really to drill down deeper into the impact for specific African economies and sectors, the multitude of consequences of economic and social break breakdown, and will project forward as much as is possible given the untested nature of COVID-19. I'm Gavin Sirkin, I'm founder and managing editor of New Markets Media and Intelligence. We work with researchers, international media business to better understand frontier and emerging markets. And to lead us through this conversation is Morega Mungay, who manages the FX trading desk at AZA. Um, as all of us, he's at home in a rather rainy Nairobi today. So in case you hear some drumming in the background, that's gonna be the rain. Um, we're gonna kick off with a run through some of the key themes and insights that Morega and the AZA team are seeing. And and we'll look to address your questions as, as we go from uh, what we have today as a, as a very significant group of more than 100 company leaders, analysts and investors on today's call. Please do submit any further questions or thoughts or anecdotes, opinions, and as we go along, I'll do my best to, uh, to address those. So just pop in the chat function um, whatever you want to talk about. Um, while we can't interact physically, we do want to prove at least that we can interact digitally and effectively, if nothing else, for our collective sanity. So please share your name and organization with your comments and questions um, to, to help this feeling of connectivity or just, just let us know if you would rather remain anonymous, which is also absolutely fine. Um, speaking of which, this meeting is under Chatham House rules, but for any journalists on the call, please just get in touch with us afterwards to let us know anything you would like to cite or quote, and we'll be very happy to either confirm straight away or arrange a, a very quick follow-up afterwards. One final note, your microphone should be muted by the host, but please do mute if, if, if that breaks free and you're not muted for any reason. So with that, Morega, the, the, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Gavin, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, thanks, a lot, thanks a lot for everyone who's taking a, uh, the chance to join this webinar. Uh, wish to interact more with you and uh, we share some ideas. So I'm going to quickly take you through the presentation of how African businesses can be able to survive the COVID-19, uh, considering it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a global pandemic and uh, of course affecting everyone in the economy. Uh, at the moment, we have over currently uh, over 43 African countries that have already confirmed, uh, confirmed uh, uh, the coronavirus uh, case. And of course, the first one uh, being uh, reported in Egypt uh, in mid-February. And at the moment, uh, statistics show there are over 2,000 reported cases on the continent and still counting. Uh, if I quickly take, just uh, show a breakdown on this, uh, we have South Africa, as by yesterday, we, the day before yesterday, we had 402 cases, Egypt, uh, 327 cases, Algeria, 201 cases, and Morocco, 122 cases. And uh, just to mention a few, because uh, Nigeria is one of the biggest economies in Africa, we have uh, 35 confirmed cases. Uh, I just got news some, a few minutes ago that uh, we, the number of South Africa has already grown to 709 from 402, which is quite a big uh, growth. So... Remember, China is one of the biggest trade partners in Africa. And uh, at the moment, we have over 1 million Chinese nationalities in Africa and over 10,000 businesses uh, owned by Chinese in Africa. And at the moment, we find that uh, the global economy, uh, UN predicts that the global economy is going to shrink by 1 trillion this year. That is quite humongous. And uh, it's going to affect uh, each and every one of us. So it's about time for us to be able to at least caution ourselves and uh, work closely with the governments uh, and ensure how we, can be, how we can be able to survive with these uh, uh, tough times. Uh, we oversee the growth of uh, economy to drop by 1.2% uh, this year in the region. Uh, and of course, uh, attributed to the, uh, the global pandemic and the GDP expected to drop by 50% uh, across uh, the nations in Africa. Uh, 29 billion in terms of uh, lost revenue uh, so far uh, with regards to the coronavirus. 
And uh, the reason why this, uh, we have this experience is because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, China is one of the biggest African, Africa's trade partners. And uh, with the coronavirus and uh, issues affecting, uh, uh, the global issues affecting, uh, being affected by coronaviruses, there's a multiplier effect. Uh, and uh, we've seen a lot of uh, demand from raw materials from China uh, decrease. Uh, and that's at least uh, led to less demand for production in China. Uh, I mentioned uh, China is a big exporter of uh, commodities to Africa and uh, vice versa. Also, Africa imports a lot of commodities uh, from, uh, from China. Just to mention a few, uh, Africa normally imports uh, electricals, machinery, computers, uh, mineral fuels, and uh, on the vice versa, we export uh, a lot of raw materials such as uh, crude oil, iron ore, tea, soya beans, and precious metals, just to mention a few, to China. And uh, taking a scenario whereby there's a lockdown in the, the there's been a lockdown and of course, of course a slowdown in the economic activities and the production sector in China, this has had a huge effect uh, to the African economy. Uh, South Africa so far has uh, cut its economic growth by 1.5 percent uh, in Q1. Uh, remember, South Africa normally exports a lot of uh, manganese, iron ores, and uh, chromium ores to South Africa to. To, 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 to China alone. Uh, and again, also tourism sector, Africa, South Africa is one of the biggest tourism, the tourist destination in, in Africa. And of course, with the travel restrictions uh, being uh, imposed by uh, most uh, jurisdictions, uh, this has had a toll order on their uh, tourism sector. So it's really affected them. On the other hand, uh, we've seen higher prices of goods in African countries due to reliance on the export from China. Uh, so far, we forecasted a 50 billion drop in export from China. Uh, why do I say this? Uh, uh, China being in slowdown in production at the moment, uh, the few goods and uh, commodities that uh, African nations have imported, uh, they're slowly running out of stock. And so far, there'll be some sort of uh, pressure and in terms of prices of whatever is existing and whatever is uh, currently imported because uh, realize that uh, cargo ships uh, and uh, cargo planes, uh, uh, the movements have actually been slowed down. So. The, the number of, the number of uh, movements has actually come down. Uh, we also see some shrinkage of foreign direct investments by five to 15%. Uh, as of this year, uh, the UN uh, Agency for Economic uh, Commission of Africa Agency had uh, projected uh, 5 million, 5% uh, growth of uh, foreign direct investment uh, across 2020. But uh, of course, uh, we're looking at uh, the global pandemic of uh, coronavirus, this is actually reversed. And uh, we've seen the shrinkage uh, projected between five to 15%. At the moment, uh, we find that uh, all the mergers and acquisitions, uh, all the investors who were looking to come into invest into Africa, everyone is trying to look at, uh, take a, a step back and uh, wait and see approach because uh, this is a new phenomenon, this is a new virus. Uh, we've never dealt with such a, uh, such a phenomenon be before. And uh, of course, uh, at the moment, uh, every economic, every nation is trying to look up for ways of uh, looking for a vaccine to be able at least to come out of this. Uh, the aviation, energy, and automotive industry have been being greatly impacted uh, with this uh, in line. So uh, like I'd also mentioned down, uh, we see some slowed uh, schedules of capacities by shipping companies. Uh, ports in China are not loading and cargo flights are being canceled. Uh, this has actually been uh, experienced. Uh, we've seen even uh, shipping companies and cargo planes docking, uh, landing and docking in, uh, in the African nations have drastically reduced because of production has reduced in the Chinese economy. But however, we're looking for something positive probably uh, with uh, at least uh, the positive effect that uh, Hubei, Hubei, that's uh, uh, where Wuhan is uh, located. Uh, no new cases have been reported so far. So I think uh, in the coming uh, uh, future, we'll probably see this reverse. What do we expect to happen? Uh, that's the question uh, we should be asking ourselves. What do we expect to happen in the African nation and of course in the global economy? Further recession for the continent, uh, with the more and large scale uh, quarantine travel and uh, travel restriction and social distancing, will lead to a fall in consumer and business spending. Uh, uh, can mention uh, South Africa's already uh, mentioned uh, as of for Thursday they're going to have a 21 day uh, lockdown. Uh, South Africa, Kenya has already uh, imposed a, a ban on uh, international flights from Wednesday. That is to Wednesday. Uh, any international flight is coming, going, uh, and coming back to Kenya, they've actually been banned from, uh, uh, from Wednesday. 
Uh, Nigeria has done the same. Uh, they've restricted travels to the high risk areas. Uh, Uganda has done the same. And of course, uh, many other economies, uh, many other countries in Africa have already uh, uh, done the same. And uh, this has an impact on the revenue collected and the business spending. Remember, these uh, uh, industries being affected, there are no revenues coming in again. Uh, tourist, uh, tourism is uh, coming down. And of course, uh, the business spending pattern is actually even uh, dip dipping. Uh, the other thing is uh, we expect to see some loss of revenue causing uh, layoffs and inevitable, an inevitable rise in unemployment levels. Uh, remember this time uh, people being quarantined, uh, people being uh, uh, restricted to move uh, and of course uh, looking at people who probably the nature of business uh, entails uh, a lot of traveling, a lot of uh, commodities moving here and there. There's going to be a sharp decline in revenues and of course uh, sharp decline in revenues as businesses uh, probably may not be able to uh, support uh, your costs, uh, such as uh, uh, cost of employees, cost of infrastructure, cost of uh, running the business. So at this point in time, uh, if uh, the situation uh, status uh, course remains the same, we might see some rise in employment rate. Uh, the other thing is uh, we might see some uh, corporate uh, bankruptcies uh, putting pressure. That's uh, where we've seen some pressure on the banking and financial system. Remember, a lot of uh, businesses uh, in Africa and of course across the globe, uh, at some point in time, they need some financial assistance from a financial institution so they will be able to grow their business, can be able to boost their business and uh, at least uh, if they're able to boost their businesses, uh, they're able to grow the economy. And, but then uh, at this point in time, since the spending patterns are actually going lower with the travel restrictions and the quarantine measures and uh, production uh, across the globe uh, from China is actually going down, it means that uh, economic activity and uh, movement of uh, cargo and uh, people is actually being restricted. Uh, so uh, people are unable to expect uh, pressure on the financial institution because uh, we find that uh, people will be able to finance their debt obligations with financials and uh, this will put some pressure on the economy. So that's something we anticipate uh, if the uh, scenario continues. Measures being taken by some of the governments to abate uh, the economic impact. Uh, we've seen some ease of monetary policy to keep markets functioning and currency stable. Uh, so far across the globe, we've seen over 30 central banks uh, uh, cutting their interest rates uh, so as to be able to at least uh, uh, cushion the economy from uh, some, some sort of recession. Uh, in Africa, in convention, uh, we have, uh, I mentioned earlier, South Africa cut their interest rate between, uh, from uh, uh, 6.5 to 6.25. We had uh, Ghana cut from 16% to 14.5. Uh, and Kenya just the other day, yesterday, they had the NPC, they, first, they, had the NPC, they cut their rates from uh, 8.25 to 7.25. Uh, just to mention a few, and of course, also look at uh, Nigeria the other day. Uh, they devalued their currencies, uh, technically devalued their currency uh, in a bid to probably uh, support the economy and uh, empower and at least push for more inflows in terms of exports. Uh, but then uh, they had the MPC meeting yesterday, but then uh, they decided to keep the uh, interest rate uh, at par, uh, just to watch out on how they, the, the scenario is gonna pick in. So these are uh, some of the uh, economies and some of the measures being taken by some of the governments. We expect to see continue more. And of course, you're looking at some of the governments like also Kenya and uh, Uganda, Nigeria, they're looking for, for, for additional support from World Bank to be able to cushion the the, the economy and also support uh, the health sector. How can you survive this pandemic? Uh, these are some of the things you're looking at uh, uh, for- Marika, let, let, me, let me just come in at that point because we've got yeah. a lot of uh, very relevant questions to some of what you've just been saying. Um, so, so one question is, is from Matt Mossman from Institutional Investor. Which countries in Africa are best placed to avoid COVID-19 impacts and, and why? Uh, I would mention uh, Madagascar and Ghana. Reason being is that uh, uh, looking at the GDP and the total contribution of uh, export to the GDP is 10% and 15% uh, uh, respectively, that's Madagascar and, uh, and uh, Ghana. And a lot of this uh, is actually looking at the contribution to the GDP is actually very minimal. So this pandemic may not have so much impact for, for, for such nations. On the other flip side, uh, I can also mention uh, countries like uh, South Sudan, uh, Angola, and uh, DRC. Uh, these uh, countries whereby you find that uh, a lot of their exports, uh, they contribute at least a total, 90% of their total exports uh, go to uh, 
uh, China. That's for South Sudan. 40% of, uh, 60% of Angola's exports, uh, global exports are going to, uh, to, 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 to China. So likewise, 40% uh, of uh, DRC's uh, total global exports are going to China. And of course, uh, looking at the contribution to their GDP is quite immense. So uh, this will tend to have some effect and uh, pressure on the economy. So uh, I think South, Af South Sudan, Angola, will be on the flip side be affected uh, as opposed to Madagascar and Ghana. Uh, just to what, what about, what um, ju yeah, just to look at where you are in Kenya, how does that fit in with the, that scope from yeah. those most affected to the least? Yeah, good thing about Kenya, Kenya is quite a diversified uh, economy. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the total contribution of uh, uh, the imports uh, to the GDP uh, that come out of uh, China, it's actually 25%. And of course, the rest is distributed across the other sectors. So as much as uh, Kenya, there's going to be some decline in export and some pressure on the, of course, uh, even stocks running out, Kenya is a more diversified economy. So they may not have so much uh, pressure and so much effect as compared to most other uh, countries uh, as from where I look at it. Okay. And looking yeah. from an industry perspective, um, Elizabeth Ross from Kroll Associates asks, um, are some industries better prepared for this than others? How, how do you look at the spectrum of sectors? Yeah. So when it comes to sectors, uh, I think I would say there's some sectors uh, which have been caught off guard, uh, looking at tourism and travel related sectors, aviation and uh, hospitality. Uh, why I say this is because uh, uh, the restrictions, uh, the tribal advisories, and uh, the social isolation uh, uh, measures uh, governments and jurisdictions are taking are really directly impacting on these uh, industries. Uh, industries probably they may not have so much impact, uh, or maybe probably better prepared would be retail sector, because retail sector at this point in time, uh, people really trying to buy a lot of commodities to stock up and uh, maybe cushion within this period. Uh, the likes of telcos, uh, telcos uh, being a mostly digitized economy, they may not really feel some a lot of impact at this point in time. And also, of course, uh, looking at pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, expected a lot of, uh, in the health sector, expected a lot of, lot of uh, people going to hospital, maybe needing some medical attention at this time. So probably they may be a bit prepared as opposed to these other industries. Uh, yeah. Okay. You mentioned some of the responses from countries. Uh, we've got a question from Chiponda Chimbelu from Deutsche Welle about how policymakers can help cushion the blow from the fallout from coronavirus, particularly because these are African governments, which many of them are pretty heavily laden with debt. Do they have the instruments to support business? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Thanks for that. Uh, what you've seen is that uh, a lot of economies, uh, they've tried to ease in their monetary and fiscal policy. And uh, I think this is the direction uh, most African countries would tend to take uh, to be able to support their economies. And uh, of course, uh, looking at them, uh, having a lot of them having very fragile economies and uh, uh, debt uh, ridden uh, economies, uh, I think at this point in time, uh, probably uh, trying to support the economy in terms of uh, making uh, uh, facilities and credit uh, easily accessible to the, uh, the, 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 the citizens uh, would be the best uh, approach to take. And of course, also looking at probably giving tax break, uh, 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 some, some tax incentives to companies, uh, even individuals, probably at this time, in point in time, is the best to cushion them against uh, this uh, economic crisis that is anticipated. Okay. So, uh, yeah. One of the responses from government has been to write to the IMF, the World Bank, the ECB in Europe, um, and, and that's that's from the finance ministers of Ghana and South Africa that have written along with the UNECA to say that they they need help. They need specifically $100 billion of extra resources to fight COVID-19. Um, However, $40 billion of this will go to paying interest on debt. Uh, Virginia Finesse from Euromoney asked whether this is the right approach. Um, what's your thoughts on that, Morega? Uh, looking at this, uh, uh, remember a lot of countries uh, and African countries are debt-ridden uh, from uh, offshore debt. And uh, 
at this point in time, probably they'll be looking at uh, trying to ease in some debt obligation and uh, trying to avoid some economic pressure. And uh, hence the reason why uh, they want to use some of the uh, debt to pay some interest. Uh, I think that's uh, will be what I will be thinking of. Okay. You mentioned earlier um, some of the sectors most affected, least affected. Uh, one question from Praise Olutase is, what about agriculture and mining, you know, as the key sectors for many African economies? How are they faring? Okay. Also, when it comes to mining, uh, uh, remember I mentioned uh, uh, Africa is a great, uh, and countries like uh, South Africa, uh, part of even Western Africa, that's, uh, they do a lot of uh, mining and uh, do export a lot of the, these uh, uh, commodities from mine, that's uh, uh, iron, uh, iron ore, manganese, chromium. And uh, with this slowdown now, uh, we've had these countries uh, getting some effect and uh, feeling some pressure on, uh, on their production of oil because the demand has actually gone down uh, from their uh, mining output. So uh, those expected to be more pressure on these uh, countries. And of course, uh, looking at South Africa, they've already uh, uh, negated their economic growth for this year. Looking even like last year, close of last quarter, they had uh, posted a negative 1.4% uh, growth in the GDP, which is, uh, of course, going to be worse than uh, looking at uh, uh, what is happening this year. Uh, when it comes to agriculture, agriculture is also expected to be impacted. However, remember, agricultural products are not uh, purely utilized by maybe China. There's uh, a lot more uh, countries across the uh, world, uh, that means Europe, uh, the United States, uh, probably also looking at uh, uh, utilizing the agricultural products from uh, Africa. So at the moment, I'm sure we're going to get some effect on the agricultural sector, but at the moment, uh, I think with that diversification, uh, I think they're a bit cushioned uh, from where I see, look at it. Mm -hmm. And a related question to agriculture from Tom Collins from African Business Magazine. In terms of food security and agriculture, uh, are Africa's supply chain strong enough to survive and outlast the border closures that we've seen, the transport lockdowns? Uh, that's another thing. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I don't think African nations are prepared for border closures. Uh, you can look at countries like uh, Nigeria. Uh, border closures were installed uh, instilled the other day, the other week, uh, and you can see the prices of food have started. Uh, inflation levels actually skyrocketed, actually increased, and of course it was much attributed to food prices. And uh, with these borders being closed across uh, uh, different nations, uh, I think there will be a lot of pressure on the supply chain on food, and uh, uh, prices of food will tend to go up uh, and to the roof based on this. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mariga, I'll let you carry on with your presentation. We'll come, we'll come back to some, some more questions in just a few, few minutes. All right. Thank you for the questions. Uh, so what I'll take you through is uh, how can the businesses, uh, how can we survive uh, this pandemic as businesses? Uh, and uh, if I start, at the moment, our key resources is the staff, is the workforce we have as uh, entities, as companies, as institutions. So at this point in time, it's best to manage the workforce, uh, ensure the workforce adheres to health and safety guidelines, they limit their business travels, at least try and have uh, scenarios and uh, uh, situations where we can be able to support work schedules and uh, remote work schedules and ensure constant uh, communication. Remember, our staff are the ones who generate our resources. Uh, they are the resources we can be able to enhance our business to be able to produce more. Our staff, our uh, workforce are the ones who can be able to uh, support the business are the faces of the company. So managing a workforce at this point in time is the best solution to be able to have, ensure the workforce uh, have at least allay some uncertainties you have uh, at this point in time. And uh, with this, we can be able to at least uh, ensure the business survive. I know a lot of pressure will be in terms of the cost and uh, downsizing, but at this point in time, because uh, I think this is a U-shaped uh, uh, period, uh, meaning a U-shaped is that uh, is a dip you're going, and of course you're going to come back up. So. I think the best thing is to manage our staff, manage the workforce at this point in time. The other thing is uh, it's very crucial to have a coordinated response team to assess the impacts and uh, come up with the contingency plans. I know this uh, is not a scenario that has happened before. Uh, of course, uh, looking at the previous epidemics that have happened, uh, 
it's only best for us to be able to handle them in different uh, scenarios. And of course, at the moment, uh, we need a dedicated team uh, within our businesses that can be able to monitor the developments, address the stresses uh, the businesses are going to be impacted on, and uh, maybe come up with solutions, maybe to guide the senior management level, drive the, at least to come up, uh, maybe to cushion themselves in terms of uh, uh, these harsh times. Uh, but uh, remember, we still don't have a vaccine for this, and of course, everyone is allayed in fears. Uh, and, uh, uh, not really sure how much it's going to happen to their consumers. Uh, those, uh, and of course, uh, trying to diversify and trying to maneuver within this uh, economic harsh times, uh, we need a contingent, a coordinated team to be able to manage these scenarios uh, who are going to work way and above their normal business routine. On the other thing is uh, trying to uh, manage contractual obligations. Uh, I'm sure as companies, we have uh, all contractual obligations with the creditors, uh, uh, financials, we have contractual obligations with the uh, suppliers and uh, and uh, all sorts of uh, of uh, intermediaries or counterparties that we are working with. Uh, so at this point in time, looking at the scenarios and uh, looking at uh, everything uh, we have unforeseen scenarios, it's best to be able to try and look at, uh, try and manage uh, the contractual obligation, try and uh, uh, renegotiate uh, terms of engagement, uh, seek for moratorium for maybe facilities you have uh, as we try to wave in uh, with these harsh times. And of course, uh, consider the insolvency risk uh, and uh, take, take steps uh, as businesses to be able to manage your cash flows. It's best to, as businesses at this point in time to be cash liquid and because uh, we are not really sure how soon or how fast or how far uh, we're going to get out of this uh, scenario. So it's best to be able to manage our contractual obligation at this point in time. Consider potential insurance claims. Uh, I know probably a lot of insurance claims may not be able to cover for this, but we have insurance claim, insurance uh, covers that are able to cover you for interrupted businesses. Uh, so it's up to you business people, maybe try look into this, uh, check on your insurance covers, check on your insurance uh, contracts and see if you can be able to negotiate with your insurance uh, on anticipated loss in revenue so that you can be able to at least uh, share the risk and uh, uh, weave through this uh, harsh economic times uh, uh, being covered by insurance uh, claims. On the other thing, uh, I would wish businesses could establish uh, war rooms to be able to track and uh, observe orders, uh, push on revenues, push on cash flows within these harsh times. And uh, of course, war rooms are trying to work tirelessly within, uh, within their mandate, within the scenarios, within the a battle. Assume this is a battlefield and uh, we have to survive within the battlefield. That's why it's best important uh, to have uh, war rooms to be able to at least to cushion and uh, work towards uh, survival uh, with these harsh times. My other point is, uh, I think it's best for companies to prepare for succession plans for key positions. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, very clear we've uh, had some uh, uh, some of the countries, uh, top dignitary, top uh, people in the government, top people in the corporates are uh, being uh, diagnosed uh, with uh, corona, coronaviruses. And uh, being the fact that uh, we have no cure, uh, we as businesses need to have uh, contingency plans, uh, succession plans for key roles uh, that uh, drive the organization. And it's important for us as businesses uh, to look at these scenarios at 360 degrees uh, and not take anything into chance. Uh, for us and businesses to be able to succeed. Uh, remember this epidemic is not a lifetime epidemic. It's uh, something that is coming through and it's going to come off. The other thing is, uh, as businesses, uh, we need to align our IT system to be able to support uh, changing situations. Uh, looking at a lot of uh, major, most African uh, businesses, uh, uh, we are in trying to work within our workstations. Uh, a lot of us are not able to support uh, with this digital economy, not able to support uh, remote working, and not able to, right now, if you look, uh, I know some companies, uh, I don't want to mention them, but uh, you might find the companies right now at a standstill because uh, uh, the quarantine measures are being inst 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 instilled uh, within their jurisdiction. And uh, if we're able to have uh, remote working sessions, uh, have infrastructure within your business that can be able to support uh, remote working, you can be able to wither within through this storm. And of course, uh, again, uh, plan for all potential scenarios. Uh, this like uh, what I mentioned earlier, you need to look at uh, uh, alternative uh, suppliers, uh, prepare for plant closure and conduct global scenario planning. Uh, 
African be a key importer of uh, Chinese commodities? Uh, what other options do we have as businesses? What other alternatives do we have as businesses? It's, it's a point in time whereby we need to look at uh, uh, other alternatives uh, of, uh, and diversifying our portfolios in terms of investment, in terms of uh, where we source our uh, commodities uh, to be able to uh, wither within uh, such economic times. Uh, key, mostly important again, is also to engage our stakeholders. Uh, I think uh, for now, every stakeholder uh, is aware of what is happening in the economy. Every stakeholder is aware of what is happening in the global economy. And it's best at this time to be able to negotiate, uh, to be able to engage and uh, have some more transparency with your customers in terms of SLAs, in terms of uh, uh, return on investments for investors. Uh, of course, uh, return on investment and SLAs may go down at this point in time because uh, uh, things are really stagnated, things are going down, and uh, of course, it's best in time to probably engage our stakeholders because the stakeholders are the same people who we're going to engage as businesses in the new future when in terms of recovery. So it's best to engage our stakeholders at this point in time. The other thing is also revaluating our fixed costs. Uh, I know this is a tough one. I mentioned sometimes, I just hinted something on this. Uh, we, as businesses, uh, we need to look at uh, analyze our cash flows and uh, look at our fixed costs and look at uh, possibilities of maybe cutting down our costs, uh, maybe downsizing operations, uh, uh, depending on the nature of business, because I'm sure if this pandem pandemic continues in place, we may not have be able to sustain uh, uh, the, 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 the period. And uh, it's best as businesses to be able to be cash liquid within to be liquid at this scenario so that we can be able to wither the storm. Most importantly, and last but not least, is uh, redesign your 2020 strategy. As businesses, uh, I'm sure a number of us last year, towards the end of last year, we were looking at uh, uh, strategies for 2020. Uh, and of course, the strategies of 2020 did not have in line epidemic that came up uh, in the first quarter. So projections and uh, goal settings, uh, uh, may not be in line. Of course, circumstances change, the variables have changed, the parameters have changed. So it's best as businesses probably to look at and redesign our business strategy in line with the pandemic, uh, considering probably uh, recovery may start coming in the second or third quarter. So how in line as businesses, how in line are we going to be able to, to maneuver with this? Uh, how are we going to align our strategy for 2020 to support this? Uh, yeah, so okay. I think at this point in time, probably I'll, uh, uh, hand it back to Gavin. Sure. Mariga, thank you for a very comprehensive view there. Um, one question, I, I think, which you've addressed very well, but maybe just to summarize, you know, in a few, in a, in a, in, um, in a few bullet points, maybe for us, you know, how do companies, how do we mitigate against economic risk from COVID-19? You know, what would you say are the, are the key measures to, to take now? And I know you've been through that in detail, so just to encapsulate it, and that's a question from Edward Apolu uh, Edebishin from Reach Forward Consulting. All right, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, how can we as businesses be able to survive with this? Uh, I've already mentioned that, but I'll just say it in pointers. Uh, remember, uh, this is a scenario we've not been here before. So even us as businesses, we're trying to learn from what other economies have done, trying to learn from uh, experiences, trying to learn, learn from other pandemic, epidemics. So at this point in time, uh, I would say most importantly, it's best maybe redesign. Let's check our strategy for 2020. Check, check on the variables, see how we can be able to uh, maneuver, see how we can be able to uh, modify the parameters we were looking at for trade uh, currently and uh, what has changed at the moment. The other thing is, as uh, I mentioned, we need, to be, we need to be at least liquid, very liquid at this point in time. Uh, banks are cutting rates. Are you able to access uh, cheap uh, credit at this time? Uh, it's a decision probably as a business you can be able to take. Uh, if you're able to take credit at uh, cheap rate, uh, credit at this rate, uh, this uh, point in time, because uh, right now with the cutting rates, uh, banks are uh, can be able to lend at a cheaper rate. And of course, uh, getting credit, uh, cheap credit, uh, will be able to at least support your business at this point in time. And of course, uh, look at uh, negotiating uh, maybe terms with the banks. Uh, of course, uh, with this scenario, banks are willing to be more, 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 more loosened a bit in terms of uh, uh, negotiation of uh, moratorium period, the interest rates. So I think uh, that's what I would urge businesses uh, to take advantage of at this time, point in time. Okay, so that's a good link to another question, which is what threats are posed to the credit financing part of the financial industry space? Now, you've just said that, you know, banks are more willing to lend, but do you see threats as well? And that's from Timilihin Omaboboyo from 
BFT group? Yes, 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 yes. From where I, I think uh, there's a threat, expected threat on the financial system, on the banking system. Uh, this is because uh, remember at this point in time, uh, with the decline in the economies, uh, African, most African economies going to recession and uh, businesses not performing at par, uh, revenues going down. A lot of our businesses are supported by facilities, are supported by, uh, by credit products to be able to grow, uh, supported uh, by they've taken uh, very huge financial obligations from uh, financials to be able to spur their growth. And at this point in time, uh, looking at the economy, looking at this pandemic, uh, uh, and consumers being confined, uh, travel being restricted. You see, all these uh, factors around are going to really affect how businesses are going to be out output of business. And uh, if the output of business is affected, uh, means that the revenue is going to decline. We're going to see sharp decline, decline in revenues. If uh, sharp decline in revenue, it's going to be a bit hard for financial for borrowers. Uh, that's uh, borrowers to be able to service their financial obligations. Uh, uh, with their financials, so at this point in time, we that's the, that's 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 the risk we are facing. That's the risk we are facing. Uh, businesses are not able to support to 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 meet their financial obligations. Uh, okay, and very, very taking that risk right home to where you are. Um, we got a question about startups in Africa, for example, in Kenya, where they don't seem to get too much government support, um, and and in the in the light of COVID-19 given that on a day-to-day -day basis this is an uphill task for them just to survive you know how do you how do you see startups in in Africa and maybe maybe look particularly at Kenya this is from Gitomi Munge from Gitomi Munge Advocates. All right uh, thank you for that Gitomi Munge. Uh, for startups uh, you know startups is quite a it's normally very it's normally a very hard time for for business when they're in the starting period. So that's when they, they face a lot of risk of uh, collapsing, face a lot of risk of not succeeding uh, because uh, probably this is the first time they are facing through these challenges. So they're not able to maneuver within these challenges. So uh, for startups, I would think uh, maybe probably get mentors uh, to be able to guide you. I know a lot of startups probably come from young, young, uh, uh, from the youth and uh, at this point in time, probably get some guidance from uh, consultants, uh, get some guidance from mentors who've seen uh, be able to sail through such uh, economic hard times. And of course, also, they look at your cash flows or check how much your cash flows can be able to wither you within this period. Because uh, as for a business, uh, liquidity is key. If you have no liquidity, you're, gonna, you're not gonna be able to survive. So I think that's what I, the, the advice I would give for startups. And of course, uh, try and take advantage of uh, cheap credit at the moment. Uh, and try and negotiate terms with your financials. So uh, that's what the advice I would give to startups. Okay, and another question on credit and funding is about the online community platforms. You know, how do you see the prospect of African startups getting funding from these online platforms? Do any of these work? And that's a question from Temideo Joss from Telljets. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think for this point, at this point in time, uh, Investors, most investors will try to take a step back. Uh, and uh, there are two types of investors. Uh, those investors who try to buy uh, when the valuation is down and of course those ones who, uh, who take a step back, uh, they may not want to take a risk at this point in time. So for that moment, uh, they might get opportunity from uh, investors who want, would want to invest in the business at this point in time, probably when the, the valuations are a bit low so that they can be able to cash in uh, eventually when the business grow. But of course, on the other, on the other flip side, uh, on the crowdfunding uh, modality, uh, looking at these uh, scenarios, I think uh, it may not be the best time for an investor. An investor may not maybe have the appetite at this point in time probably to invest uh, when they, there's a lot of uh, uncertainties. And uh, remember, like I mentioned, uh, uh, we've seen some decline. Uh, those uh, ex projected uh, foreign direct, in direct investment of 5% uh, this year, but that has actually gone on the flip side. Uh, we expect a decline between five to 15%. And uh, this will affect uh, scenarios like this uh, for startups uh, through crowdfunding. So uh, that's my point on this. 
Okay, I'm going to bunch a few different questions now because they're all relating to a similar theme about how companies manage. So firstly, how do you manage costs during these uncertain times? You talked about liquidity and keeping things in, in cash as much as you can. That's from Michelle Mboha from Growth Africa. How do you optimize business for more profitability? Ask Ilyich Tago from Diagri investment enterprise, what micro level stimulus practices can be implemented by small businesses to recover from the downturn, asked Robert Otiende from Prime Bank Africa. And finally, how do businesses stay afloat? What should the communication strategy be right now to, to customers, to potential customers, to their network, asked Sonia Cabra from Bupas. All right, thank you for that question, for those questions. Uh, I think uh, at this point in time, uh, uh, how businesses can be able to remain afloat, uh, considering uh, the quarantine measures, the so self-isolation, the travel restrictions, which in turn, uh, a lot of our businesses are uh, highly dependent on this uh, for them to be able to uh, grow, to be able to uh, maybe reach their clients uh, and uh, customers. So one thing I'd mentioned, uh, I think it's the best time to be able to renegotiate your terms, uh, your contractual obligations with your suppliers, your creditors at this point in time, and uh, maybe get moratorium periods uh, for financiers, uh, credit terms. Because at this point in time, you will also see uh, people who've been guaranteed, uh, companies who've been guaranteed, uh, and uh, they're not able to perform as per the guarantees. Uh, that's uh, looking at uh, likes of uh, bank guarantees they might end up being recalled uh, because uh, uh, certain parameters have not been met. And uh, of course, uh, this is much attributed to uh, the coronavirus. So I, I would really strongly urge businesses to try, try and uh, renegotiate their terms with the financials, with their suppliers, try and cut as much as cost as you can to be able to stay afloat. Because remember, you need to have liquidity to be able to survive within uh, such a pandemic. Uh, uh, and to be able to stay afloat uh, within such a crisis. So that's uh, what I'd be able to advise on this point in time. Uh, yep. Okay. We, I mean, we, I suppose we're all looking for other circuits that are going to break in this. Um, you know, we talked about earlier about, about oil exports to China. Um, question from Sam Mutambra is, is there a possibility of, short, of, of fuel shortages in Africa itself, particularly in a place like Uganda, for example, as an importer? Do you, do you see the border issues or any other issues creating uh, constraints on supply of fuel? Uh, yes, thank you for that question. Uh, uh, I think uh, we might see some constraints on this uh, fuel supply and oil supply. Uh, reason being, uh, with the, with, the, with, the, with the crashing of the oil prices. Uh, I think for producers uh, at this point, this is, a, this is a point whereby there's no incentive to increase production and the price is actually down. So as producers probably they would want their consignments of oil that have already been produced to maybe to wither down. And uh, 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 this point in time, that's why we might see some shortages uh, coming in through. So. Uh, with that reason in behind, uh, we might see some shortage, shortages coming in. Okay, so kind of related question from Abigail Komu in Antler, from, from Antler um, in Kenya. What are some of the lessons that export or import heavy countries can learn from this pandemic, given that particularly that this is something that could occur again in the future? Yeah, so I think the key lessons are for key exports and uh, key importers uh, is to have sort of uh, some diversification uh, in terms of uh, where we source our commodities, where we ship our commodities. Maybe also, I think Africa is quite a rich continent with a lot of resources, with uh, a lot of, uh, of course, uh, looking at uh, maybe the income levels may not be as high as the Western side, but uh, there's a huge population for ready, uh, which is ready market for produces that Africa has. So I think uh, Africa needs to push a lot more on uh, 
intra-Africa trades and uh, try and uh, probably have uh, uh, spur more economic uh, interaction within the member states uh, and of course uh, in the neighboring states and of course uh, try and do a lot of diversification uh, in terms of economic sectors. So uh, I think that's the advice I would give uh, us. Okay. What, what measures, I'm going to punch two questions that are, again are a similar theme of FX and currency uh, quite close to your heart, Morega. Um, what measures has the trading desk at ASA itself yeah. taken to counter the current bearish market and economic disturbance in the short run? And that's from Zacchaeus Mule from Credit Bank. And related to that, what changes have you seen and what are your expectations for FX and foreign currency payment flows, ask Ellie Martin from Currency Cloud. All right, thank you for that question again. Uh, I think as a trading desk, uh, from a trading desk perspective, uh, this point in time is whereby we need to be able to keep uh, hedge our positions and uh, at least to cushion ourselves against uh, the market movements. Uh, remember at this point in time, there's a lot of uh, depreciation of uh, African currencies and uh, of course, uh, I'm sure as traders, a number of us probably may have gotten some heat here and there from uh, positions they've been having. So at this point in time, is uh, it's the best to maybe hedge your positions, uh, keep square positions and whatever currencies, uh, net open positions you have, at least to be able to wither that down and also caution against uh, uh, this market movements. Again, uh, in terms of the FX payments, I think uh, we've also seen some decline in terms of FX payments. Uh, uh, coming into, into Africa and also, again, also going outside. Uh, and this is because uh, most of uh, the Western nations that uh, normally send uh, FX payments to Africa are quite affected. And of course, uh, the businesses and their income levels are right now quite constrained. So uh, we'll see some decline uh, in terms of FX payments uh, at this point in time. Yeah. Looking broader at business opportunities, what, what are some of the opportunities that you see out there that um, perhaps people can tap, businesses can tap as a result of the, the virus? Um, that's a question from Martin Kian. All right, some business opportunities. Uh, I think at this point in time, uh, you might see a lot of valuations uh, for businesses have actually gone down uh, because uh, income streams uh, uh, quite uh, degenerate, actually quite uh, going on low levels. Uh, so at this point in time, as a business uh, investor, probably it might be a good time to be able to take advantage and uh, take, a, take up a business and invest in it because uh, you might get it at a good discount uh, as opposed to uh, when the scenarios and uh, when the economy is actually thriving. So at this point in time, probably you might get one or two persons here and there who might be really need to uh, exit a certain business because they're not able to survive and it's not really favorable for them. So uh, as a business, maybe as an investor, probably you might have so, uh, some funds and uh, you might want to get at this point in time and invest at this point. Uh, so that's an opportunity I would, uh, I would mention that uh, maybe businesses may be able to take advantage of at this point. And, and related to that, a question from Egosa Iwone from Sara procurement services which is basically what what can you what should you be looking for in client orders um, as a business maybe to to use as an opportunity what what are the client facing opportunities do you think for businesses uh, at this point in time I think uh, mostly retail remember with the restrictions with the quarantine measures and uh, border closures uh, a lot of uh, citizens and uh, I would say generally, people would want to stock up uh, things uh, based on their sanitities and maybe just to cushion themselves uh, because they're not really sure what is gonna happen next. Uh, some countries probably have seen uh, they've even been fined uh, to move outside the house. Uh, I think in Africa at the moment, we've not really felt that, but uh, at this point in time, we might head to that uh, scenario uh, considering the cases have actually been uh, growing. Like I mentioned yesterday, the day before yesterday, we had uh, seen cases in South Africa had gone to 402. At the moment today, we've seen uh, reported by the health minister they've uh, skyrocketed to 709. So what might happen is that uh, businesses uh, or individuals at this time uh, would want to maybe buy uh, household uh, utilization goods and things that uh, they can be able to keep them afloat uh, within this period. And of course, uh, uh, as uh, 
the pandemic grows and the number of infections grows, uh, I think there will be a lot of fear on how much on the movements of within uh, individuals. So I think from a business perspective, uh, retailers at this point in time probably would be able to thrive a lot because uh, I know uh, they would have a lot of pressure on uh, the goods they have, uh, people going to buy. And of course, manufacturers of these uh, commodities also maybe uh, having a lot of pressure and uh, trying to produce more and more to be able at least to meet the, to meet the demand because uh, uh, meet, the meet, meet the supply because demand um, as well is expected to increase further as uh, people try to take a precautionary measures to uh, to buy stuff and cushion themselves with this, this, this within this period. You talked before about your perspective as a currency trader. Um, one question is about commodity traders and you, you know whether you see. A, a, potential benefit for commodity traders? That's a question from Peter S. Peter from Bugsnet Co. Limited. All right, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I would give an example of uh, gold. Uh, within this swine flu, uh, Zika fever, Ebola, we had some different uh, market reaction and the prices of gold uh, uh, based on uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, fever, this uh, epidemics, and the reaction for the market was quite different. Uh, probably because uh, uh, maybe these uh, fevers, uh, these uh, epidemics were coming from Africa, mostly impacted Africa. But then the fact that uh, this is uh, affecting China may have uh, a different uh, perspective. So on the commodity prices, so it depends uh, with which commodities. Uh, you are trading on. It depends on which commodities you are trading. Some may be able to thrive at this moment, some may not be able to thrive at this moment. So uh, that's the answer I would give for this. Okay, taking back to currencies, um, what will, will alternative currencies, um, I, I guess like cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, how, how will they compare with fiats, uh, fiat currencies, um, the, the standard traditional currencies after the pandemic? That's a question from Darren Franks from Talent in the Cloud. All right. Uh, thank you for that question again. Uh, I think uh, with the easing and uh, improving of the status of the uh, Chinese economy, Chinese uh, in infections in terms of uh, reduction of uh, number of people being infected uh, in uh, Wuhan. Remember when this uh, pandemic just came in, uh, we saw a decline in the prices of Bitcoin. But then uh, as this improves, uh, the price is actually rallying up. Uh, rallying up. So. Is that a matter of uh, wait and see? But uh, remember, a lot of the, the miners are based in China. So, and uh, them being on lockdown uh, means that mining was really the, the mining capacity was actually constrained. Uh, so, uh, that's why we've seen even the prices actually dipping. So, I think that we'll see some reverse effect on this uh, as uh, the process improves. As we can see, China is actually recovering slowly by slowly uh, out of this pandemic. Uh, we can see even. Uh, uh, Wuhan, they, they've actually started opening up their boundaries and uh, the the lockdowns. So, for me, that's uh, that's my will be my take on that. Okay, taking a taking a continental view across Africa. Um, question from Rich Finley from Griffon Strategies is: How is the local media in these countries positioning the crisis, and what's the impact of that on business? Uh, I think for businesses, uh, the media has actually tried. Uh, I think there's been a lot of, uh, looking at Africa, there's been a lot of uh, responsible uh, reporting and uh, uh, being guided by the government uh, entities on uh, misreporting information. I think uh, the media has tried to at least uh, contain the situation, trying to manage the situation and uh, reporting the accurate figures uh, just to ensure everyone in the society, everyone in the economy is uh, up to date and uh, uh, is in line with what is happening. And uh, I think for this uh, matter, they've uh, tried to ensure the public cushions themselves uh, more and more and uh, try and uh, uh, also try and uh, advertise and uh, push on more precautionary measures uh, individuals can be able to take at this point in time. And uh, that's uh, really been uh, uh, championed by media. And uh, I, I can think I can say thank you to them for that. Uh, come along okay. in line to help us in this, in this situation. Okay. And 
kind of related to that, Kume Chibsa from Afro Valley um, looks at the balance between uh, crisis management of social welfare and the economy. Um, I suppose this is this is a balance that politicians um, are having to make everywhere at such a critical time to bring a unified force to this challenge. Um, Kume says, what, "What's what's your perspective on that? The, this this trade off, I suppose that." everyone's having to make at the moment between um, social welfare and econo and the economy? I think at this point in time is actually uh, a good stand uh, that uh, we find that uh, most economies are trying to uh, support their individuals, support their citizens at this point, harsh times. Uh, and of course, we're looking at economies trying to get uh, uh, facilities and uh, debt from uh, uh, the World Bank to be able to cushion and uh, maybe support the health sectors. Uh, this will be more like a, more of a social, uh, social uh, trying to support the society with this pandemic. And uh, I think uh, the governments are really trying their best uh, to monitor this situation, to contain this situation from further spreading. And uh, you've seen a lot of economies, uh, a lot of countries, uh, like I can even give an example of Kenya. Right now they have uh, quarantine centers whereby if you're suspected, uh, you have uh, the, the, the virus, uh, you're quarantined there at least, uh, at least uh, for some time, at least uh, just to avoid the spread. And, uh, uh, most of our African economies are also doing the same uh, across the globe. Uh, so I think uh, it's something the governments are trying to do within their, uh, within their mandate. But of course, uh, if given opportunity, they can be able to do further, at least to support this uh, and uh, ensure further mitigation is taken and uh, caution against uh, more spread. Okay, um, we're almost out of time, but I've got time for just a couple more questions that we've had in. Uh, one is from Matt Mossman uh, from Institutional Investor, which is looking at FDI, and you know this is going to be incredibly difficult to to do, but project if you can into 2021, 2022, um, considering that uh, some of the deals uh, were were um, far long enough to be completed remotely. Um, how do you see the prep work, the on the ground work for deals coming up in 21, 22? Is there gonna be a drop off in FDI? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we expect to see some drop in FDI for 2020. Uh, that was by UN, uh, they mentioned uh, uh, we're going to see a drop in FDI from 5 to 15, between 5 and 15 percent. And of course, uh, most of these FDIs are trying to take, uh, the investors are trying to take a back step and uh, watch how the scenario is going to be. But of course, uh, looking at uh, uh, the second quarter, third quarter of this year, I think uh, we are going to be able to come out of these scenarios. And uh, I think uh, for foreign investors, probably it's be good for them to take a view at this point in time. Maybe uh, uh, Get some long-term view and uh, see how maybe 21, 22 maybe will come along. So, uh, looking at that in mind, uh, I would uh, stick to that. Um, question from Praise Alutuase: In a scenario where this virus lasts a, a good deal longer and most people stop earning an income, um, how do how do economies manage? consumer demand post the virus? That would be a tall one, actually. Uh, I think this is where now the government really needs to come in through. Uh, if consumers are not able to, to meet their, their needs, they're not able to, they don't have um, income, uh, they're not able to meet their needs. I think uh, this will be a case of where governments need to come in and at least try and support the economy, try and support the, the citizens of the nation, and uh, probably also uh, uh, international organizations such as uh, World Health Organization maybe will come at this point in time, try and uh, uh, support uh, this in time and, uh, and cushion against uh, further. Because uh, remember, with income levels going down, uh, there'll be a lot of pressure on the economy. All the economies will be going to recession. And of course, uh, uh, the citizens are not going to be able to, to support themselves and uh, debts are not going to be as going to continue being unpaid. Uh, of course, uh, if you're living in a rented house, you're not going to be able to pay your landlord. Your landlord probably has uh, obligations to pay to the bank. Uh, you're not able to go to people. So it's going to be a multiplier effect. So I think uh, maybe governments need to come in more and uh, try and uh, 
cushion us and uh, cushion the society and try and uh, give uh, stimulus measures and uh, more uh, easy in terms of monitoring fiscal policies to be able to have uh, businesses uh, survive this uh, uh, pandemic. Okay, very final question from Egosa Iwone from Sara Procurement Services. With liquidity in certain unstable currencies comes a problem during this pandemic, especially those who are dependent on oil. What can one invest in during this period or hold liquidity in in order to avoid a shortfall in business assets and liquid cash? Yeah, uh... I think for businesses at this point in time, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's best for businesses to at least to try and uh, ensure they have sufficient liquidity to be able to wither themselves uh, with this this uh, period. Uh, remember, we don't have uh, we don't have a certainty that uh, this uh, pandemic is going to be over within the next two or three weeks or the next two or three months. So, as businesses, I think uh, whatever liquidity you have as a business, uh, whatever costs uh, or fixed costs you can be able to 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 save on. This is the best time to try and cushion yourself because uh, as you can be able to try and weather your business within this pandemic. Uh, so uh, liquidity is key at this scenario. Uh, businesses need to maintain the liquidity levels at least at levels uh, to be able to sustain the businesses. So try and businesses try as much as possible to cut the costs, uh, necessary costs, uh, necessary uh, expenditures for the business and at least save that for a rainy day. That's, okay. Uh, Thank you, Morega Munge. Thank, thank you so much for taking us through that. Morega is, Mar is Trading Desk Manager at AZA, based in Nairobi. And thank you to the team behind uh, Morega's analysis today and, and for organizing this event. And thank you to all of the participants for really very penetrating questions. Um, just a reminder, again, for any anyone on the call that wants to um, write about this, uh, please do just get in touch with us to let us know uh, what you'd like to cite or quote, and we'll be very happy to either confirm or to arrange a very quick follow-up. Um, thank you again to everyone, and, and stay safe in your homes. We wish you all the very best during tough times.